The San Francisco Public Library African American Center presents a conversation with Thomas Fleming, writer and co-founder of The Sun Reporter, San Francisco's African American weekly newspaper. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Daphne Holmes, and I'm the, in the Exhibitions and Programming Department here at the San Francisco Public Library. And I welcome you all here and glad you could all join us this afternoon. We're here this afternoon as part of what seems to be becoming a wonderful series of appearances by this remarkable man, Thomas Fleming, who has so much history and knowledge about San Francisco and the Bay Area from everything from just how the city has changed to the civil issues that have come up for African Americans and others in this city. He is just a wealth of knowledge. So we are very pleased here at the library that we have finally had an opportunity to get him here and have all of you hear what he has to say. Um, in order to do this kind of programming, we have support from the Friends of the Library and the Library Foundation. And so without their support, we would not be able to do this type of and this level of programming. A couple of announcements in addition is that at the end of the program, Max Millard has a book, um, Reflections by Mr. Fleming, and a tape that will be available for sale if you're interested. We also have a sign-in book over there that we encourage you to sign so we can keep you apprised of things that are going on here. And then we have a number of flyers, one of which um, tells you how to connect with the San Francisco Public Library's African American Center, which is also greatly responsible for this particular program here today. Um, Paul Robeson exhibit, which has been extended through September 30th, which is up in the African American Center on the third floor. Um, Shaping San Francisco, which is another take on the history of San Francisco as kind of an adjunct, if you will, to what Mr. Fleming is going to tell us. And then we have a listing of African American children's books that are over there, all for your enjoyment to take with you today. So I'm going to turn it over to Noah Griffin, writer for The Independent, um, someone that has helped us a lot with our Unsung Heroes programs and a number of others. And he graciously agreed to be the moderator for this afternoon, and we really appreciate him making the time to come here and be with us. And so, Noah, I turn it to you. How happy is he born or taught that serveth not another's will, whose armor is his honest thought and simple truth his utmost skill, whose passions not his masters are, whose soul is still prepared for death and tied into a world by care of public fame or private breadth, who envies none the chance doth raise nor vice, hath ever understood how deep his wounds are given of praise, but rules of state nor rules of good, who God doth late and early pray more of his grace than gifts to lend, who entertains the harmless day with a religious book of friend, this man is free from servile bonds of hopes to rise or fears to fall, lord of himself, though not of lands, having nothing, yet half all. The character of a happy life by Sir Henry Wooten really characterizes Tom Fleming, the Tom Fleming that I know and have known for several decades. Fiercely independent, a very passionate man, uncompromising in his beliefs and his judgments, a very loyal person, a very perceptive man, yet a very warm man, and also someone who I think Emerson sums up as truly an individual. Emerson says there's a time in every man's education when he arrives at the conviction that envy is ignorance, that imitation is suicide, that he must, for better or worse, take himself as his own portion. Though the whole universe be full of good, no kernel of nourishing corn can come to him but through his toil bestowed on that plot of ground which is given him to till. Trust thyself. Every man vibrates to that string. And that is indeed what Thomas Fleming has done for over 90 years. And I'll close this introduction on, uh, on a brief poem by uh, County Cullen. I doubt not God is good, well-meaning kind, and did he stoop to quibble could tell why the little buried mole continues blind, why flesh that mirrors him must someday die, make plain the reason tortured Tantalus is baited by the fickle fruit, declare of merely brute caprice doomed Sisyphus to struggle up an ever-ending stare, Inscrutable are his ways to man, yet do I marvel at this curious thing, to make a poet black and bid him sing. 
Tom Fleming has been singing for over 90 years, and we're very delighted to have him here, and I want to thank the main library. I want to thank the Library Foundation and Daphne for allowing us to interview this wonderful human being. Tom, welcome to the program. I think we sell you short if you just say that you've been someone who uh, has observed the San Francisco scene. Your scene goes back to many, many years prior to that. And won't you tell the audience a little something about yourself, when you were, where you were born, and where you were born? I was born in Jacksonville, Florida, November the 29th, 1907. And the earliest I can re recall of my days in Jacksonville, I was with, living with my father's mother, Phoebe. She was quite a, quite a character. My mother left, left uh, there was a divorce in 1912, and my mother came to California. I, I tried to explain to you how she happened to come to California then. Her ex-stepmother had left uh, Mount Gurney, Alabama, where my mother was, grew up, was born, as a maid for a wealthy white, white Alabama family, for, who first took her up to New York City. Then they came west to San Francisco and sailed from uh, San Francisco to Honolulu. And when Grandma came back, why, uh, my mother had a brother living here then. He'd been in the American Army during the Spanish-American War. And when he came back, uh, I demobilized, it was probably around about 1900, he decided he didn't want to go back down to Montgomery, Alabama. So he stayed in San Francisco. Well, when Grandma came here, she knew that he was here, so he got in touch with him to prevail upon her to stay and not go back down south, because uh, going down south then was worse than going to prison. Uh, so uh, my mother and father divorced in 1912. And my mother came to, came to California. Her grandma was, communicated with her all the time and persuaded, uh, persuaded her to come out here. Because in the meantime, grandma had got married again because there was an old elderly gentleman up in Chico, California, who had a lot of property up there. And he came down here looking for a young wife. So grandma was available. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so uh, my mother came to get me. I remember the day she came to get my, my, uh, meet my grandmother's house. And since I was the firstborn and a boy, grandma didn't intend to let me go. So she hid me. And that, and that was the day that my, my mother was going to leave on a train with my sister, who was just two years old. And I think I was five. It was in 1912. So you took the train from San Francisco, from, from Jacksonville to San Francisco. Let me finish okay. this part. <laughs> Grandma died about, 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 five, uh, about the time I was six years old, and my father went up to New York City. Well, my father was, uh, I guess he got around quite a bit, because when he married my mother, he was a Pullman porter. And, uh, and he'd worked at sea on ships, too. So uh, he wanted me to bring, bring wanted, uh, uh, me to come up to Harlem where he was living then. He knew all of the, at that time traveling in America, you either had to go by, by, by ship or train. There weren't any busters in the airplanes at all. And there was a, a coastwise uh, passenger ship uh, uh, company on the, on, uh, that operated between Florida and New York City. My dad knew the, the crews, all the crews in, in, in the stewards department then, because all, all, all the uh, people working in the stewards department were black, waiters, cooks, and waiters, and cooks. I mean, waiters, cooks, and porters. The chief steward was always white. So he arranged with, with one of my, uh, with, with the crew on one of those ships for me to, to bring me up to New York. Because after my grandmother died, my mother's oldest brother was still in Jacksonville. And I was staying with him. So my dad wrote and told uh, my uncle what day to have me down at the, 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 the Clyde Line docks for this particular ship. Well, the date arrived. My uncle brought me down, down there with my little bag. And uh, one of the porters off, off the ship came down and got me, took me and hid me in the, in the cruise quarters and said, don't come out till this ship clears the harbor. Well, I did as I was told, and of course you must realize 
I was a stowaway at the age of, of seven years of age, going up to New York City by myself. So uh, when I got to New York, my dad met me at the, at the, at the pier down on, on West Street, that's, you know, along the Hudson River there. And that's the first time where I saw those Fifth Avenue buses then. You know, they had the double-decker buses in New York City then. And there was a subway, and then there was the elevated railway. I saw a lot of things I never dreamed about when I got up there. So he took me up there in, uh, up in Harlem, and uh, we lived on 133rd Street then, between Lenox Avenue and 7th Avenue. Harlem wasn't quite entirely all black then in, 19, in 1916, because there was still, uh, you still hadn't got uh, uh, all black teachers in the schools up there. Most of the teachers were still white. So you'd find a black teacher occasionally then, back then. So uh, uh, I enrolled at the school then. Guess who was going to school there? He's a couple of years, about three years older than me. Fat Swaller was going to school there. He was playing the piano every, sat every Saturday and Sunday at the old Lincoln Theater on 135th Street. In between classes, all of us kids followed him around all through the campus all day. Well, I stayed there in New York all through World War I, and I saw a lot of things then, because my father got a job as a cook on a, on a ship to carry ammunition between New Haven and New York City. I think they were getting all those, you know, both Remington and Winchester had, had you know, uh, had their, uh, their, their factories up there in New Haven then. And this is the coast wise team, and that's all that hall was freight. So we'd leave New York every uh, on the evening we left then and go on around through Long Island Sound. And I remember one night we were going there, and there was a patrol boat out there in the harbor, the Navy had, I suppose. They fired a, a rocket across the bow of our ship and told us to all the, lower the, the lights. So we docked at New Haven uh, oh, sometime uh, 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 during the night because when I woke up the, at the next morning, we were tied up at the dock at New Haven. And while I was on there that, that, that summer of 1917, I saw my father identified all types of warships. I, I, I learned what a battleship, the difference between a battleship and a destroyer. The battleship's the biggest, then the next largest, the cruiser, then the destroyer, then there were submarines, and then all the small auxiliary vessels. Well, I could tell, uh, ident identify the class of those ships then at that age. I used to watch uh, the, 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 the kids swimming up there in the, in, the, in the Connecticut River up there in New Haven, and I yearned to do that, but there were, I didn't see any black kids there, so I never did go on there. But whenever we did want to swim in New York, up in Harlem, uh, on, one, on the west side is the Hudson River. On the other side is the East River. Well, coming through Harlem, they call it the Harlem River. We want to go down there and swim to black kids. We, the, 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 the Irish kids live in, uh, the Irish live on one side of us, on the west side, going up toward Morningside Heights. On the other side, going down to the East River, there's all the Italians down there then, a few Jews. So, uh, when we wanted to go down there, we'd make an alliance with the Irish, and they'd come down there with us. We all armed with, <laughs> with swords and carved out of wood or baseball bats <laughs> or whatever we could get our hands on. And uh, we'd have to find our way through to the river because the, the Italian kids would come out there and their mothers were shouting at us in the town. We didn't know what they were talking about. We'd get down and we'd have to pull some guards out there near, near, near that part of the river where we swam in. So uh, at that time, there was a, uh, uh, the Germans were bombing London pretty heavily at that time, you know, from the Zeppelins. And rumors were spreading across the Atlantic that they were going to bomb New York City, too, one night. So my dad was quite a practical joker. He came in the building, running in the building one night, a uh, five-story building on 133rd Street, yelling, Germans over the city. <laughs> Everybody started pouring out. <laughs> <laughs> well, when they found out that my old man had cracked a joke with him, they wouldn't jump him, but he, he got out of the way. <laughs> Another thing I saw then, I saw contingents from the French Army, the British Army, because they used to have all those big uh, Liberty Bond drives, you know, marching down Fifth Avenue. And then uh, the, the Marcus Garvey organization was, was very big in New York City then, that Back to Africa movement. 
And they used to march down 7th Avenue. 7th Avenue was, it was a boulevard for us up there in, in, in New York City because uh, also on 7th Avenue was the old Lincoln Theater. And out in front of the Lincoln Theater, they had a tree that had been growing out there. They called it the a hope tree. All the entertainers would come down and kiss that tree or something, hoping that luck would change. They would get, you know, get a date. So uh, uh, the Garveyites used to march down there, and he'd have that, that you know, that cockade style hat that admirals wear in the Navy. He'd be standing in a car with open top and had that, that uniform on, that coat looked like a, a naval officer's. And of course, there'd be blacks lined up on all sides of the street, particularly kids running around. <laughs> and we would watch it. And I, I didn't know, know that, I didn't realize that, realize at that time what the movement actually meant. It was just a parade coming down 7th Avenue. I didn't realize that years later, after I came to California, just the significance of that, about that steamship that he bought. Uh, so my mother had two older sisters living over in Detroit. They came over there one, one, uh, one summer uh, after the armistice. Oh yeah, I was there when, when the Germans quit fighting. And, uh, and also then New York City was blacked out every night because there's the, all that, you know, that rumor was going around about the Zeppelins are going to bomb New York. And then there, the, there was a little bit concerned about the submarines prowling off the harbor. Well, that, that, that summer of, of 17, uh, uh, 18, when I was with my dad, I remember uh, uh, they would make up those convoys for ships carrying the troops across the bay. Because you see, the government, uh, either the British government, had seized all of the Canard Line ships all the White Star Line ships, and, and they painted them that dark red, and they were taking troops over, over to Europe. I, I recall seeing, we, uh, when we first declared war on Germany, that the, the, the Volta Line was tied up over in Hoboken. That was, that, that was the biggest, biggest passenger ship in the world, and it belonged to the North German Lloyd Line. Well, if they, if they had they left New York Harbor, the British were going to seize it. Well, we hadn't got into the war yet. And uh, so it, it tied up over there in the whole well, as soon as we, uh, as soon as we declared war, well, the United States government seized it, and it became a troop carrier also. And after the war, later on, I noticed that ship was renamed the Leviathan. It was my, it was in the transatlantic Atlantic and passenger business, operated by the by the uh, United States lines. And of course, uh, there were two other ships I used to see in the harbor every night. I saw them years later out here. The Yale and the Harvard, they were passenger ships that operated between uh, on the Fall River line. They left New York every evening and then uh, went up to Fall, uh, touched at Newport, uh, Boston, and Fall River was the end of the line. Then they'd come back. Well, they had two ships, both of them named after, one of them named after Yale University and the other named after Harvard. So, uh, when my aunts came up there and saw that I was playing hooky more when I was going to school, she wrote and told my mother she better get me out of New York. I'd end up in Sing Sing. Because I was playing hooky more when I was going to school. And uh, I was learning a lot of bad things. You know, the, 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 uh, the, the Italians were pushing those push carts around with selling vegetables on the streets of Harlem. And then uh, in the summertime, they'd be the, the, those taking, pushing those carts we were selling ice cream out there too, and then uh, I, I saw a lot of the, the others would come up there with the, oh, the organ grinders had that monkey, and they'd be playing <laughs> that uniform on the monkey. They'd be playing that that hand hand organ, and the monkey they have that little cup out there begging. Well, we used to follow that around when I was a kid. So uh, my dad finally uh, uh, decided to send me back down to Jacksonville in 1919. So he got in touch with the crew again. The crew brought me to back, back down to Jacksonville, and my uncle met me. And I stayed there for, oh, about three months. And my mother sent a ticket from California for me, for me to come out there at 11. To come, come out after come she Come to called. California, OK. So. My dad came back down there to see me, and all was also one of my aunts. They said, "You're going a long ways." I had no idea how far away California was from from Jacksonville, Florida, at all. Because uh, I had rode the train some early. My grandmother used to take me to, to Thomasville, Georgia, and also to St. Augustine and, and Daytona Beach. She used to take me there because we had relatives in uh, in Daytona Beach, 
And uh, my grandmother was born in, in, uh, in Thomasville, Georgia. I, she never did talk good English. I think she was what you call one of them black Seminoles. Mm -hmm. Because the slaves that in those days, were, uh, in slavery time, would run away, and the Seminoles would let them come in and live with them. And, uh, and, uh, and the Seminoles was a tough tribe at that time because they retreated into the Everglades, and, and the army couldn't come in there to get them. And that, after many betrayals, uh, uh, betrayals, they finally, uh, you know, surrendered, and they took them from there to Oklahoma. It was a very sad story. Well, the day came for me to leave. My dad was down, and Aunt Katie came down. So, uh, what they did for me, they take one of those big uh, wicker backers and fill it up full, full of sandwiches, and my old man gave me five dollars. So he started uh, blubbing and said, I mean, I'll see you again. You're going a long ways away from here. Well, they put me on the train, and the conductor pinned my, 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 my tickets on the lapel of my jacket. And of course, I started to, they had what they call those vendors on trains, and they sold soft drinks, candy, and magazines. So they went to the cars, you know, uh, yelling out what they had, and they were selling to the passengers and who wanted any of this stuff. So I started buying, uh, I started spending my money right away. And uh, uh, the first, first change we made was at, at, at Flemington, Alabama, coming to New Orleans. I think I left, left Jacksonville on, on, uh, on, the, on the Southern Railway, and at Flemington, I got on uh, Louisville and Nashville, and which brought me into New Orleans the next morning. So the conductor brought me into the depot there and turned me over to Traveler's Aid. And, uh, the, and uh, the Traveler's Aid took me over, so the, 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 the social worker asked me had I had breakfast yet. I said, no. So she took me into the lunch counter there and fed me and then told me to stay there all day because the train to, to California was leaving that evening. So I sat there in the depot all day and still spending, spending what little bit I had. So. Uh, we finally left, left for New Orleans that night, the train bound for California. I think it was the Sunset Limited, because that was a through train operated in those days. I didn't know it then. Between New Orleans and the other end of the line was San Francisco. It was the only through train that, that came into San Francisco, because all the others from Chicago and other places, they came into Oakland. But this is the only one. Overland that came in, you know, that came from outside the state, that came into in the San Francisco. Well, we got on there, and I thought we're never going to get out of Texas. We rode all day the next day and into the evening. And I wonder what kind of place this is. It wasn't getting out of there. So uh, we were there all that day and all that night, and I woke up to, uh, finally got into, in, into, uh, into New Mexico. And then it, that wasn't too long. And, and, and then into uh, Arizona, and then to L.A. Well, well uh, the Sunset Limited didn't come. Uh, it came north to San Francisco, but not the way I was going. I had to get on another train then, stay in the depot all day in, in, in Los Angeles. So they, uh, later, uh, tra travelers, they took over again, fed me, and they watched me and saw that I got on that train that evening. I got on a train uh, called the West Coast. It was uh, headed from Los Angeles to Portland. On the southern, I'm on the Southern Pacific now. And uh, so uh, that was overnight from uh, Los Angeles and got in Sacramento the next day. And that's why I got off, because that train didn't go through Chico. It went up on the, on the west side of the river through Willows. Chico was on the east side of the river. And uh, I laid over there all day, so Travelers Aid again took, took over. They took me and then fed me, so the, 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 the worker asked me what was my mother's name and the address, and I told her she looked in the phone book, there was my mother's name in there, in Chico, because then Chico used the same book the Sacramento did, as well as Marysville and all those other little towns, but just one a phone directory for all of them. So uh, that, uh, I caught a train that, e that left Oakland that evening uh, called, called a senator. It left open and got in Chico. That was the end of the line at 11.30 that night. So uh, 
I came on up, the train got in Chico, so the conductor said, well, Sonny, so you've come a long ways. He said, this is the end of the journey for you. And so he helped me to get together, and I came out there, and I saw this lady standing out there, and this man, and my mother says, Thomas? And I said, yes. I didn't know her, because when she left, I was five years old. She started hugging me and kissing me. And I tried to pull away from her, so she slapped me alongside my head and said, I'm your mother, what's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> so Katie didn't go to bed. My sister, uh, they're, they're eight, 19 months different between the two of us. I'm the oldest. Mama didn't bring her to the depot. She uh, had, had my stepfather with her. And so I came in, but Katie was, was wide awake, waiting to see her brother, whom she'd never seen, because she was only two years old when she left Jacksonville. And, uh, and then, uh... So you're, you're 12 years old now? Yeah. So uh, I got up the next morning, and I looked out there and saw all that vacant land out there, and she I said, told my mother, I want to go back to New York! <laughs> <laughs> So did she immediately enroll you in school? Yeah, she did. I, I, uh, I enrolled because my father didn't send any records out with me anything. Uh, my mother put me in the class with my sister, and I should have been, a, you know, at least a half a year ahead of her. And, uh, and the teacher liked me there so well because in geography, uh, they would start talking about, well, there wasn't very many kids in, the, in, in Chico then who traveled as extensively in the countries I had. <laughs> so uh, uh, my teacher, her name was Virginia Wright, and uh, she liked me. And so she arranged for me, uh, the, the, they, they had a bell, a, a belfry there, and, and there's some student they assigned to ring the bell every day. And so uh, Miss Wright arranged for me to ring the bell, and then she also arranged that the, the, when the, the, the Arrange, rang the bell that the students all assemble out there. Then I had a drum. I would come out there and, and uh, they'd be assembled up, and the, the teacher would look over and she told me that I hit it off. And I thought, da -da -da. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the beat for people to march on like you do in the army. So they went in, and uh, and uh, it, it was excellent. There, I, I soon uh, learned to like, you know, living in a little town. It, it, it was tough at first. Uh, you know, I yearned to go back east again, but. That wore off, and I stayed in Chico and got on through high school up there. How many black people in the town? There were about, uh, of all sexes and ages, uh, there were about 65. Compared to an overall population? Of overall population, all ages, as I said. Out of that, there were about six kids in, the, in my age group. And, uh, and I, I got through. Uh, went, on in, went on in high school, and my mother uh, bought me a violin at first because I saw my dad playing a violin, because, uh, uh, I, and I thought that was the thing to do until Henry Herbert got a saxophone, and I said, I want a saxophone too. So I'd work picking prunes that summer. I must have been about 13 years old, and I, uh, and I, I, oh, I'd earned about $80 that I had saved, you know, picking fruit. So I went in the in the store there and told told <laughs> in the music store there and told the the the, the owner that I want to get that saxophone. So he says, well, he says you're too young to sign a contract. He says, where do you live? And I told him. He said, I'll come out and see your mother this evening. So he did, and uh, my mother says, well, I can't let him spend the whole eighty dollars. I think the horn costs about sixty dollars. She says, because he's got to get the clothes for school. So she said, I'll finish making the payment. She says, I'll give you. $20, and I'll finish making the payments myself. And that's how I got acquired a saxophone. And I uh, had a lot of fun doing that, because one of the guys who was in the band, and then later, uh, Babe Bowman, he played trombone, and he was slide, and they'd be, making all those jazz notes then when we were in high school. And we used to jam together. Mm -hmm. And he would later played with Anson Weeks' band, which played at the Mark Hopkins here for years. Very famous band. Yeah. And uh, I'd see him occasionally after I came down here, but he was over at my house all the time. And another thing that happened up there that probably wouldn't have happened in South that I, I invited white kids to our house to dinner. My mother fed them, and they, they, and, and, and they, they in turn invite me to the house. 
I don't say it was all, it, it, it was perfect up there because you'd hear that word, people would talk you out in the streets and call you, know, that word in. They'd call you that, some of them would yell it at you. And then, of course, if he looked like he's my size, I'd go after him. <laughs> and they stopped calling me that then. And I, uh, 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 so Henry Herford and I handled that very well as far as race relations was concerned because he and I were the head of about, there were two Chinese in there, three. Because that Chinese family, uh, their mother was the, was the biggest bootleg in, in Chico then. <laughs> Well, that was during the days of prohibition. And those boys always had a lot of money because their mother, because she's always getting busted, but she managed to have, and because one of them had a lot of guns that we used to go out hunting with him. Uh, I was with him one time when he killed a 300 pound black bear. <laughs> he let me take one shot, <laughs> but he brought it down. And, uh, and in that way, we uh, 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 used to hunt all the time for our dogs every, every day. Or every other day, I'd go out and kill maybe three or four jackrabbits and bring them home. And then my mother would take and chop that all up and make stew and feed the dogs with We had two dogs. And then, uh, uh, as I told you about, about uh, dynamite and the fish, but we fished all the time. And uh, when shad time came and uh, the shad would come up to spawn in the Sacramento River, we had a big iron hoop about that size like that. And we made a basket out, out of that with chicken wire. They had a long pole about eight, eight feet long that we'd come to the banks of the river and, and, and put that basket in my name facing downstream. So when the fish would come up, you'd feel, uh, you'd get a small bump, you, you, you know, you'd feel the contact, you'd wait and maybe another couple of fish would come in there. We'd bring it up, we got, got free fish. Uh, other times we'd go to work, uh, we'd come down there and do it when the salmon ran in the fall, we'd go down there with spares and spare them. We didn't, <laughs> didn't use no, no look hooks and line, we spared them to make sure, and we always spared enough fish so we'd have salt it down, you know. Uh, and I, I learned other things up there. Uh, my grandmother's alive, she showed me how, how, how you cure olives, you know. You can't pick olives off the tree and eat it. It ties your mouth all up. So what, my grandmother had a big oak, uh, oaken barrel there. So she'd get, oh, maybe a couple of gallons of, of olives and put them in that barrel and put, put lye water, put them in lye water. And they, they'd stay in there 14 days, she'd pour the lye water off and uh, wash them over. Then uh, uh, she'd put salt in that water then. And that's the way they cured olives all over. Put salt in there, leave them in there. When you want to eat an olive, you take one out of the barrel. So tell oh. me, how did you get down to San Francisco now? When I finished high school, uh, there, there wasn't any work up there. I came down here the summer of 1926. And uh, that's the first time I'd met my cousin, too. I'd never seen him. Mama and Kate came down here to the World's Fair in 1915. They stayed at my uncle's house. That's when he lived over in San Francisco. And my cousin graduated from Lake Wilmington High School in 1926. My uncle bought a home over there in Berkeley near the campus. Mm -hmm. uh, so I saw Tom that night. I came down because my mom and Katie came down here before I did. And uh, they were down here about three weeks before I came down. And I came down here and went to a dance so over there at, uh, in Oakland. I had never seen so many so many black people who danced before in my life because I didn't go to dance when I was a little kid in, in New York. And there must have been about 500 people at that dance. Was well, this it was sort of high or... popping to me then. Where, where was it? Do you remember the name? It was of called that? McFarland's Ballroom. McFarland's the switch Ballroom. was over there also, but this was called McFarland's Ballroom. And it was some 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 black uh, 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 fraternal organization was, was having this this convention in New York. I mean, in Oakland. And of course, the, the dance was one of the highlights of it. And so when I, I got there where Mom and Kate roomed that, I, I, uh, the, the lady told me, said, your sister went down to the dance down there. I knew it was going to happen. And so uh, uh, she told me how to get there, and I went down there. So the first thing Katie says, says, have you met Tom yet? Incidentally, his name is Tom, same as mine. His father's name was Tom, and my old man's name was Tom. So there were four Toms in our family. <laughs> I guess they liked the name. Well, Kate brought me up to Tom. 
And, and he said, I said, glad to meet you. He said, what do you mean? He said, we should have been knowing one another all of our lives. So uh, he said, where are you staying? I said, well, I don't know where. He said, well, you're going home with me. So I went home with him and uh, early the next morning, because uh, uh, his mother and father heard him talking to him, so they didn't know who it was. They yelled out, who's that? So he says, it's Tom. He says, Tom who? He said, my cousin, Tom Fleming. So of course, they were curious to see my uncle to see his nephew, whom he'd never seen. <laughs> and I think uh, when the old man was eating his breakfast, uh, he started saying Tom. So my cousin answered. He said, I don't mean you. I mean, I mean uh, Tom Fleming. So I came out there, and I said, these people act like they don't like me too well. Just giving me one, one look. And so uh, I didn't come down to stay with him. I think that's the way he and his wife looked at it, because I came down here looking for work. Well, uh, after I stayed there the second night, uh, uh, my aunt told me, she says, well, we're going to, we got friends coming out here from Boston. They're going to stay there because Tom's going to sleep up on the divan in the living room. And my friends needed, well, I, I, I understood what it meant. So I came on down and came right on over here to San Francisco. And they had the same sort of shipping out here in, in the Pacific that they had on the Atlantic. You had the Admiral Line. Pacific Steamship Company. They had their, 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 their headquarters in Seattle. And uh, the Admiral Line belonged to Great Northern Railway. They're the ones who put those passenger ships in, you know, in, in the Pacific. I think the farthest north they went was in a, up, to, up to Alaska. That was only in the summer month, the Dorothy Alexander. Then there was the HF Alexander, which competed with the Shasta Limited between here and Seattle, made the same time at sea. She also competed with the Lark overnight from, from here to Los Angeles. <laughs> same, left the same time the Lark did, got in Los Angeles the next morning the same time. And uh, I worked on the Emma Alexander. Alexander. The Emma was uh, another ship, a passenger ship that had been seized by the United States after war broke out in World War I. And uh, the Admiral Line acquired it. Well, I was bellhop on there, and, 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 and that was, a, was an interesting job because we, uh, the first time we left here, we were headed north to Seattle. And we got up to, uh, I was a bellhop, and I was picking up tips then because what they were paying the bellhop then, I think, was $15 a month. Well, you got your room and board on there, and they figured if you couldn't hustle and make up the rest of it, why, well, it's just too bad. But you, you had a place to sleep and could eat. When we got to Columbia, the, I mean to Victoria, going in the, after the inner Puget Sound, I remember the waiters and, and, and uh, the bellhops was buying whiskey there. That was during Prohibition days also. You could get a, a, a quart of whiskey up there for $2. So we would stock up there every time we, uh, every, every time we stock in Victoria. We got in Seattle later on that day and uh, got rid of all the passes. Then we went on up the Sound, around the Sound, to, to Tacoma, Washington, where the ship laid overnight. And uh, came back the next day and put passengers on, and we started the return trip back. And I acquired another bottle of, uh, of, of good booze up there. So when we got to San Francisco, the custom guards knew what, uh, what to expect. We'd hand them a bottle and let us take the rest of it through. <laughs> and uh, we kept that whiskey for one purpose. A number of times, one of the one of the one of the film companies would, would film sea, sea, uh, sea scenes on these ships, and that's when it was real crazy on there because most of them seemed like we're crazy. We were selling them that booze. We paid two dollars a bottle for. Them. We were selling them for thirty-five dollars. It's during prohibition. And uh, and I and and, and uh, I one I don't know whether any of you old enough remember one famous actress named named BB Daniels and, and Ben Lyons. They were in that that company filming these these sea scenes. And of course, we picked up a lot of money in tips because they were they wanted everything. And uh, so I stayed over, made about three trips on there as a bellhop, and then I got in t in trouble with the bell captain. He wasn't as tall as I was. He was big, about big enough to be a jockey. But he was, uh, he looked like he was about 35 or 40 years old. I'm, I'm just 18 then. Mm -hmm. And so he said something to me. I said, when we get up to Seattle, I said, I'm going to kick you so-and-so. He said, when you get up to Seattle, I'm going to kick you off this boat, too. 
So I started thinking. I hadn't thought about that part of it. <laughs> and uh, there was a guy who was washing dishes on there, and he would like, wanted to be a bellhop, so I traded with him. I got from under, the, under the, that bell captain. And uh, so I stayed on there the rest of the summer. And then, uh, of course, the pastor business fell down. They started reducing personnel on those ships then. And uh, I went back up to Chico. Well, Grandma was still up there. The bed was still up there for me. I went back up there, and uh, that was the, the fall of 1926. No, 27. And uh, of course, I have to tell you this, this part about the Sacramento Northern. The Sacramento Northern was in an urban electric line that operated between Oakland and Chico. Chico was the end of the line, the northern end. And uh, all electric all the way. So they had one, one dining car, well, a combination dining car, club car, and observation car, but I think there were tables enough in there to seat about, about 12 pastors at a time. Well, I met the, the, the waiter on that, Bill Sherry, because he was courting a local Chico girl, because the train got in Chico every night at 11.30. And, uh, and Bill knew I was back in town. He knew I'd been spent the summer down, down here in the Bay, so he came by there in February and knocked on my uh, uh, bedroom window at my grandmother's house. So he said, hey, Thomas, you want a job? I said, yeah. He said, well, they need a waiter on the train. She said, you know, the train leaves at 7.30 in the morning. I said, beat out the depot. Well, I went and told grandma, I said, well, I'm leaving you again. And I uh, met the train. So, uh, and so I just put on a white jacket there. I didn't do anything just, you know, to take me down there. At that time, all the trains, there wasn't a bridge anywhere on the bay. The Sacramento Northern had, 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 had their, their train ferry up there just this side of Pittsburgh at Mallet Island. That's where it docked. A little further down it was, uh, was Port Costa. That's where the Southern Pacific had, had their passenger trains, uh, ferries. So uh, we, that's where I worked, on that ferry down there. And, and, and you stayed on there. Uh, you got one day off a week. Well, I stayed on there for about uh, oh, until spring came anyway, anyway, and I overstayed my, 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 my leave one time when I came back. Incidentally, a black man operated those ferries for the, for the Sacramento Northern, George Dunlap in Sacramento. He had the concession. He furnished the crew and bought all the supplies. And, uh, and uh, I, I had known his daughters in Sacramento, so when I got back, I'd stayed, uh, uh, overstayed my time. He was there that time, passing through. He says, where do you want to go, back up to Chico, Oakland? I said, I'll go to Oakland. I came right back down to Oakland, came down to the Southern Pacific Commissary the next day. And the first day I came down there, they were looking for a dishwasher, fourth cook on, 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 the, on the dyno on the San Joaquin Flyer. I got the job. And I stayed with the Southern Pacific then until uh, from 27 until Oh, about 1931. I didn't have enough seniority. I uh, got bumped all the time. So then you relocated here for good. I came back here and stayed, and uh, there was a guy. I, had, you know, I knew a lot of people on the campus over there because my cousin was going over there. And Uni University of California, Berkeley. yeah. And uh, there, uh, there was a a great, uh, a famous athlete. I don't know whether you ever heard him name uh, Robert Coleman Francis. They called him Smoke Francis. He made all city in football at, at Old Poly High. Mm -hmm. He was on the track team also, and of course he went over to Berkeley. He got made the football team over there. Was on the track team. Well, I, I became acquainted with his mother and his sister, so uh, used to go by there all the time. So one day, my friend said to me, "She said, Tom, you got a good mind. Said, why don't you go on back to school?" I said, "Well, I uh, uh, I says I don't have any money," and I says. Uh, I'm trying to, uh, uh, trying to keep myself together this. She said, well, there's a four-year school in Chico. She said, why don't you go on there? I said, that's right. My grandma's still living. I went back up to Chico, then and enrolled, and stayed up there, oh, three semesters. Then I transferred down to San Francisco State. Then I went to the University of California some. I, I, I would go there like a, I'd go to intercession, because by then the WPA was in business. Mm -hmm. And I had worked, uh, wrote on the school paper at, at, at Chico State and also when I was in high school. And I, I, said, I, I thought I, I would like to be a newspaper man. So I went back up to Chico and, uh, and I, I wrote on the Wildcat, the newspaper up there. So uh, uh, when I came back down there, I got on the WPA. Well, uh, 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 
the first time they sent me out as a common laborer, and then they found out I'd had a couple of years of college. They said, well, you don't belong out here with the laborers, because the laborers, I think, was, get, was getting $64 a month. Well, I was classified as, as a professional. They were paying us $94 a month, the Federal Writers Project. We did all our work up there in, in Bancroft Library at the University of California. And I, 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 uh, I, there was a couple of, couple of uh, classes in the, in the extension division on the campus. Of I started taking a couple of classes up there. Is that where you met Carlton Goodlett? I met him uh, uh, in 35 when he came out here. This was before he came out here. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, that writer's project up there, the, you know, we, we staged a strike against the government. We were <laughs> real rebellious. <laughs> well, what were the reasons? We were demanding higher wages. We said, there's enough money. And, uh, they, uh, uh, and uh, well, they finally dissolved it. And then they sent me over to work in one of the labs over there on the campus. And your affiliation with the University of California at Berkeley began then? Yeah, yeah. What year was that? That must have been about 30, well, I was working for, for the WP up there when, when, when Carlton, Carlton came out here in the summer of 1935. He just graduated from Howard University. He came out, with, out here with the intentions of getting in the program for the master's degree. Mm -hmm. This guy is truly a remarkable but guy. After he got out here, he decided to take the comprehensive for the PhD. He passed it. Never, never did get a master's degree. <laughs> Passed it and did it in three years. When Carlton, when Carlton got his PhD, Carlton was 20, 22 years old. He did it in three years. And I never, and that cat used to keep me up at night up there working in the Institute of Child, uh, Child Psychology up, on, up there on Bancroft. It's where, it's where uh, Bolt Hall is not. There used to be a wooden building in there where, uh, where the Institute of Child Psychology was. That's where Car I used to go up there and study along with him. We did a lot of things over there together. We got into a lot of mischief. <laughs> we were together every day on the campus. We didn't, if you saw one, you saw the other. And then a young black doctor came out here, uh, Legrand uh, Le Lawson Coleman, and uh, Carlton read in the, the California Voice over there. He graduated from Howard. University Med School. Well, Carlton went up. We brought me down. We introduced ourselves to mm -hmm. him. Well, he was single like we were, and on top of that, we knew all the young women. He didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so you had a distinct advantage. <laughs> <laughs> How many uh, African Americans were on the campus at Cal then, as contrasted with the total student body? They could have been then when Carlton. Yeah, that's the first year it reached a hundred. Enrolled over there on the campus, mm -hmm. both graduates and undergraduates. I think there was 105 in 1935. Maybe more than that. Well, wages were much lower than that. And Carlton, you know, he, he ran into trouble with a lot of people over there. He didn't, saw, didn't see any black faculty people over there, and he thought there should be black faculty people over there, so he tried to get some of the distinguished black uh, uh, graduates, like uh, George Johnson who later became Dean of Howard Law School, and Walter Gordon, who was uh, well known to everybody, uh, a prominent lawyer over there, and who was a classmate of Earl Warren. That's, that's why Walter got- the uh, first Walter Camp All-American. Yeah, so. yeah. And, uh, uh, but they didn't seem interested, because Carrington wanted to try to get uh, e. Frank, uh, e. Franklin Frazier on there, set up a chair. Mm -hmm. But uh, they, they wouldn't buy it, so, uh, but, uh, this guy was very sharp and, and, and had a first class mind. I never seen anyone quite as bright as him before in my life because he thought fast on his feet. And uh, how he later became involved in, this, in, 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 in the reporter because he wasn't here. I'd like for everybody to get it clear in their mind. Carlton had nothing to do with the founding of the, of the reporter. He wasn't even in San Francisco. A man named Frank Logan and I started the reporter and Carlton was down in, 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 in Tennessee that year. He just finished uh, 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 Meharry, and he was doing a uh, uh, practicing in Columbia, uh, uh, Tennessee, one year, so he could get reciprocity with California. Mm -hmm. He knew about it, because we wrote to one another every day after he left here. Now, Meharry's in Nashville. 
Yeah. And you started the reporter in what year in San Francisco? 1944. 1944. He came the next year. And he didn't get in the paper right then. He didn't get involved in the paper until 1947. He started lending me money right away. <laughs> he and Dan, Dr. Dan Collins, too, to keep the paper alive. Now, Dan Collins is the first African American on the faculty of UC Med Center in the School of Dentistry. He was. Right? 1944, is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Now, you might want to explain to the public that before the war, there were what, maybe 5,000 African Americans in San Francisco? The 1940 census said, said there was less than 5,000 blacks living in the San Francisco. And then when the war began, some 50,000. The war workers started coming in. Now, I'm talking about in 1940, the census. Mm -hmm. They started coming in short, right after Pearl Harbor. The war workers did. And uh, Oakland, Oakland then in 1940 had a, a black population of about 13,000. Berkeley had about 6,000. Imagine that, Berkeley, much smaller than San Francisco, had more blacks living over there than lived over here. What was the climate for African Americans in those days prior to the influx of uh, the shipyard workers and the families? Well, it was a little different than, than, than you'd find down south. You were refused service, service here just as well as you were down south. You couldn't stay, stay in any hotel, big hotels in San Francisco. You couldn't eat, the same thing in Oakland. You couldn't eat, couldn't eat in the best restaurants there. And in fact, uh, some of those uh, hamburger places over on San Pablo Avenue had signs in the window that said, we have the right to re re refuse service to anyone. Well, we knew what they meant when they had that sign in the window. We just didn't go in there, that's all, because you know what you're going to meet. Now, around 1946, 1947, there were enough African Americans to put up a candidate for the Board of Supervisors, uh, F.D. Haynes, out of Third Baptist Church. How did that come about? Well, Gullet and Dan thought, uh, looked at it, you know, because both of uh, both of them had lived in, in big cities in the East, where they had, uh, you know, big big black populations, and they didn't like what they saw here because San Francisco, in, in fact, liked to enjoy the re the reputation of being one of the most liberal cities in the United States, but it wasn't. Because I remember when Marion Anderson used to come here for concerts, Paul Robeson and Roland Hayes. They could not stay in the big hotels downtown. And the big restaurants, even those big restaurants down in Chinatown, refused the service, ref refused them service. The Chinese did the same way the majority of people did. They wouldn't serve you. And uh, so uh, we saw how it was, all these blacks pouring in and thought it was time for us to become active in politics. So uh, we sat down and talked about it and we, we, we uh, uh, we decided somebody should run for supervisor that year. I think it was in 47. And, and, and Haynes seemed to like us pretty well because we could, uh, well, Goodlett was a Baptist. He, he, he became a member of Haynes's congregation, too. And a young doctor coming here in town and doing pretty well. So we talked to old Haynes, the runner. He didn't know anything about politics. He was very naive, very unsophisticated outside of his church. I, that's what I have to say. So we thought this would be a good choice. <laughs> so, so we convinced him, and uh, that's the same year that George Christopher ran for the Board of Supervisors the first time, too. Well, George Christopher cultivated us very heavily, thought, thought that we should form a joint ticket together, which we did. And then uh, Frank Havener was a congressman from here then. Mm -hmm. We convinced him to convince the, 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 the county uh, central committee to endorse Reverend Haynes. It was tough doing, but they reluctantly did it because they saw how, how, how the population was changing here in the city. And, and Haynes, uh, uh, I think there was, uh, I think there was about 10 candidates. He's finished six highest. And, uh, and there were only three, three slots that year. He finished six high. Well, of course, uh, 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 Christopher made it then. And I can tell you some more about Christopher. After Christopher was elected mayor, he made certain promises to Goodlett that what, what he's going to do about making black apartments here in San Francisco, which he failed to do. So this little guy, he very slow, he went down to the mayor's office for a day. I was with him. And got into the inner sanctum, and he 
got a name and, uh, right in front of Christopher was dead. And he said, George Christopher, you're a horse's ass. <laughs> Well, I guess the, the people should really understand what the uh, uh, what the climate was like in those days when the 50,000 African Americans came here to work in the shipyards. The Examiner had a headline that read "Negro Invasion," and after F. D. Haynes ran and almost won for supervisor, the Chronicle editorialized in those days that they would almost have to change the way in which you elected supervisors because a Negro almost won for the board of supervisors. Yeah. So it was not easy, and when George Christopher. Uh, went to the head of the Democratic Central Committee to ask for his support. He said, a Greek can never run or win in San Francisco. And that's when he changed his he registration to uh, you know, Republican. Yeah. So it was not a liberal town no, uh, it wasn't. at all. And so no. that, that was really a major step forward to run the candidate. Well, you know how big is they kept the Chinese in Chinatown? It was hard for them to get out of Chinatown. Because, you know, one thing was a tr tourist attraction. And, and, uh, and all over California, then they had what they call uh, restrictive uh, Covenant. residential covenants. Is an agreement drawn up among the well-to-do whites who live in these well-to-do neighborhoods that they would not sell to anybody else other than whites. And it stuck. And uh, so that's a method they use against the Chinese. It, yeah, they did it over there in Piedmont in Oakland, too. But uh, 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 Sid Lomax, who made a lot of money as a gambler over there in Oakland, got a white realtor who, who, who was a good friend of his to purchase her, one of them luxurious homes in, 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 up in Piedmont, and they tried for the deed to it. Well, now, speaking of gambling, there are a couple of stories about uh, establishments of newspapers in San Francisco. Supposedly, uh, William Randolph Hearst's father won the uh, examiner in a poker game and turned it over to Will Hurst, who was a ne'er-do-well, getting kicked out of Harvard, and he established the newspaper chain and, and, and dynasty out of San Francisco. And there's a story that Carlton Goodlett uh, won the Sun in part in a, in a poker game as well before it married with the reporter. You want to explain that story to the people who are here? Well, the Sun started, you know, I had boarded the Army up until 1945. I think it was St. Valentine's Day. Because one thing, I was 37, and they kept saying they didn't want anybody past 35. And I was writing editorials uh, uh, condemning the key system. That was, that was the transit system over in Oakland. They also operated ferries in competition with the, with the SP. But they operated the, the commuter trains, you know, met their, met their ferries, and they also operated the streetcars and, 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 and buses in Oakland. And Muni had broken down. I think, I forgot the year when Audley Cole was the first black to, to pass the civil service examination to become a mortarman in, 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 uh, on, uh, in San Francisco. Well, nobody wanted to take him out and train him. Only one guy named Rogers went out to te teach Audley how to operate a damn streetcar. And they, uh, 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 nobody, would, nobody would speak to, uh, to Rogers after that, so he turned uh, to drink very heavy, because he used to come by the Sun Reporter office, and he was a wreck then, and tell me all about it. Well, uh, 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 so I was writing uh, about uh, the key not, not, uh, not hiring any blacks, because I was writing such editorials that blacks are driving them big army rigs in, in the army. I said they ought to be able, they'd be able to drive buses. So, uh, I finally got greetings, and I, you know, I, I was so sure, and my draft board was over in, over, in, uh, over in Emeryville. So I went over there to see him about it, and one of the guards working in there said, they don't like those editorials you're writing, because the blacks was parading up and down in the key systems office over there on, on Grove Street in Oakland. They said I was responsible for all of that. So this girl told me, I never knew whether it was true, but she worked in the draft board, and I remember, I never forgot that, what she said. Well, uh, while I was gone, that's when uh, uh, I was gone from February till uh, August. I was, they, they had sent me back for discharge. I was up at Camp Beal. And, uh, and Goodlett, while I was in the Army, Goodlett was writing me a lot of letters telling me how to get out of the Army <laughs> because he was a doctor then. And, uh, and uh, I had started something in there. I said, I couldn't eat army chow. I said, all I did is constipate me constantly. I said, I just can't eat it. So the doctor, one of the doctors said, well, what do you do in your civil life, civilian life? I told her, I took something. Uh, and they said, well, we don't furnish that in the army. 
So I just kept going on sick call. Sick call. I did. I stayed at the hospital one time at, at Fort Francis Warren. That's in uh, right outside of Cheyenne. I stayed in there for three weeks. So they finally picked me out. And one of the medics in there told me, "Sir, you headed for, for, because you know the I took basic training at Fort Leonard Wood, and one of the things that made also made me unhappy, they." They brought a lot of Italian prisoners to war over there up in, in, the, in the Ozark Mountains in, in southern Missouri. They could go in the PX. Right. We place. couldn't go in there and wear the uniform. Yeah, it's they had that little place over there. They uh, there, uh, had two telephone booths in there for all the blacks that they had on the camp. They had banks all along the wall at, uh, uh, at Fort, Fort Leonard Wood. And, uh, and, 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 and I saw, I went in there one night. And the girl, she told me, a civilian said, you can't come in here. I said, why can't I? I said, I'm wearing this uniform. She said, well, your kind of people go over there in the area, uh, where they had an area there where, where all the blacks say that, in the, the, the barracks. And, uh, and uh, so I said, well, I'm going to use the phone in here. I said, I'm going to call my mother up in California. She called two MPs, and they took me out of there. That, that, that infuriated me even more. So I was really determined to get out, so that's when I started going on sick call stuff. First in Missouri, and then when I got to Wyoming, I continued until they sent me back out to Camp Beale. I guess the statute of limitations has run a new yeah. mission that you make here. So. And, and one of the funny things, I was corresponding with Goodlett all the time, and Goodlett told me he was back in Omaha, because he it, it finishes his year of uh, you know, uh, uh, practice in Columbia, Tennessee, and I had convinced him that California was a good place for him to come and practice medicine because when he was a student here, he didn't like California. He said, this is the last frontier. But I think he was kidding me thinking in the, in the back thought now because uh, I was writing to him before uh, I, uh, I was writing to him before I got drafted. I said, man, this is the place to come. I said, blacks are pouring in here by the hundreds. So uh, he changed his mind so he, well, uh, uh, he was, when he got to Omaha, he told me what day he was going to come through there. I think he said he was going to come. He was going to leave Omaha on a on a Monday night and come to pass through Cheyenne. Uh, Sunday night he's going to leave, pass through Cheyenne early the next morning. Well, I probably went on sick call because I thought he's coming through on Tuesday. I went on sick call after they kicked me out of the hospital, and uh, so. I, I fin uh, and then I'd gone to the hospital that, that day because they fed better than they did in, 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 our, in our quarters. Well, you got good meals in the hospital. And I stayed over there all day, you know, shooting the breeze with, uh, with, with, the, with, the, with the patients in there. So I came to, uh, back to my, my barracks uh, uh, at 4.30. I know all duty was over with then. And uh, I got my letters because I... Uh, uh, Dan Collins, the sister-in-law, was writing me letters every day, too, cheering me up. And she couldn't get cig cigarettes very well. I was sending the, the two cartoons with Will allocated in the Army, and I sent them to her down in West Virginia. So uh, uh, I, when I, 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 I uh, uh, had gone and said, got, got my mail, and I'd answered Gus's letter, and I'd gone over to the post office to mail it. I, well, I got over there, was back on the way to my area. And I saw a gray Chevrolet coming down the road, and then I saw somebody leaning out the window shaking their fist. It was good. He said, why in the hell don't you stay where people can find you? I said, well, hell, you told me you were going to come here tomorrow. He said, I changed my mind. <laughs> so he said, come on over here, man, and shake hands. I ain't seen you in seven years. Well, he had his wife with him. I noticed she gave me a look at me suspiciously. Then he's laid over there all day long to see who this guy was. He wanted to see. So he asked me how was it coming, and that's the first time I got drunk while he was in the Army. Goodly had a bottle of gin with him. We sat up there in the barracks and talked until uh, they had guest barracks up there. You know, where uh, uh, civilian guests came in, you could stay in there overnight. And uh, he asked me, he said, how's it getting along? I said, well, the guy in the hospital told me I was headed for discharge. So uh, he, came, he, he left the next morning, and, but they still held me back there. And he came through there in June, and I didn't come to August. And when I did get home, he was in there attending to my mother. He'd open up his office over here in San Francisco. Now, did he have it first on uh, Turk Street? Huh? Was it first on Turk? No, we were on uh, the, the paper office. Mm -hmm. No, it was on. Uh, no, his, his uh, medical office. 
No, it was on Fillmore. Okay. He and Dan Collins had offices together. Dan, Dan had been here. Dan came out here, I think, around about 43. Uh, he received that appointment to, you know, to, to, to do research to teach up the, at the UC School of Dentistry. And then he was practicing uh, in the, uh, practicing dentistry, too. He had an office there. So he, uh, when Goodlett came, they t shared joint offices together. And they both were, were, were interested in the paper, so uh, Goodlett started uh, learning us money. Well, the, the sign came into existence while I was away in the Army. When I okay. came back, it was a second paper here in San Francisco called The Sun. The owner of it was a white man named Frank Laurent. He'd gone down to Los Angeles and brought up two guys that I knew pretty well, uh, Wendell Green, and, uh, black guys, to run the paper for him, and A.B. Robinson. So Goodlett decided after I got back, uh, that, uh, well, uh, I, he probably was scheming, but he didn't tell me that. But Frank Laurent admired us so much, he was with us every day. And they'd have them poker games at Goodlett's house. They'd stay up all night long. Frank got in the hole for Goodlett for about $3,000. And he said, I'll tell you what I'll do. He said, if you give me $1,500, say, I'll, I'll, I'll give the son to you. That, that's how he acquired the son. And we took it over. Well, this is about as good a part as anyone. Somebody is as old as Tom is, is 90 years old, and has as much of a memory as this is only going to be the first half of an interview with him. Obviously, uh, uh, we're going to have to allow some time for uh, questions. And hopefully, we can come back here on a Saturday and get the other half. But how about a hand for Tom? And I'll <laughs> You know, I've uh, uh, been in the interviewing business in both radio and television for about 20 years. You always measure an interview how well it goes by how few questions you have to ask. I think that's the record. In an hour, I think I asked four questions. <laughs> so why don't we give you an opportunity to ask uh, Tom some questions, and maybe he can bring you up to date on what happened between that period of time that he ended and now, or get more specific about some of the earlier points. Uh -huh. Tom was in the first Coro Foundation class, and the question is, how did he become a Coro Fellow? It's an internship in public affairs. I was a veteran right out of the Army. They would uh, emphasize, emphasize, uh, 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 giving those scholarships to veterans then. And Seton Manning, who was the first Secretary of the Urban League over here, told me about it, said, why don't you try? And I went down, was interviewed. That's how I beca uh, became, a, a, you know, an intern with, with Coro Foundation. That, I was in the very first class, and I formed a close friendship with him. You probably saw his, 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 uh, his byline, his name, in, in the Chronicle for years, Robert Pop. And we're still a close friends yet. He's retired from the Chronicle also. Well, in a word, Bob said he couldn't come today, but asked me to say hello for, you, for him. Thank you. That's Incidentally, funny. Bob's sister retired. She was on the faculty up at Chico State. And I'd like to mention that this opportunity, Chico State invited me up there for Black History Month this year, and I got a whole lot of, lot of plaques and all that stuff. And, and then they had me to come back again in, in a commencement day this year, and uh, they established a, a scholarship in my name. They wanted me to present it to the first awardee, which I did. I made two trips up there this year. Our questionnaire is a lot questions. <laughs> Long-time writer for the Chronicle, editorial writer, and now writing a history of the Chronicle. Yes, sir. Oh, I know him. <laughs> <laughs> Please. Mr. Fleming, could you talk about uh, what it was like uh, in the jazz district of the Fillmore? Maybe tell a favorite story or some of the artists that you saw, and what it was like uh, as far as having, uh, seeing uh, your culture being able to flourish. Uh, with their music and uh, stand out with their identity and explore frontiers in the scene of jazz in San Francisco. Well, you have to limit him because he's one of the world's experts on Duke Ellington. So. <laughs> Jack's Tavern was the first place in, 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 uh, in San Francisco that had jazz music in there. I, you probably heard of Jack's Tavern. Well, the first person they put in there was a guy 
named Saunders King. Uh, I had known Saunders. Saunders' father was a, was a black minister in Oroville, in the Holy Roller Church. Saunders was running about my age group because my mother was also a, a member of the Holy Roller Church, and there wasn't one in Chico, so we used to come over to Oroville. And that's how I met Saunders. Uh, before that, Saunders had worked uh, uh, on radio here. And uh, with uh, three other guys, uh, 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 and uh, called Crosscuts was the name of it. They sang spirituals largely then, and, and Saunders was playing the guitar then, and, and he, he was playing it in a different beat, looked like what it would be in the church. And I was su surprised when, when Jack just that opened and put Saunders in there with a, I think it was a trio at first. And, uh, uh, but it was good jazz, man. It was good enough to, uh, to attract the attention of Herb King back there uh, in, the, uh, in the late 30s about this, 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 this good music there in the Fillmore. And, uh, and there were more whites coming out that night than there were blacks at that time. And all through the war it was the same way. And uh, then there was another place found on, uh, on Post Street called the Club Alabama. That had good music, and you know where the, that branch of the Bank of America was, that post in Fillmore? This place was right behind there, and it was jammed every night. <coughs> <coughs> Such guys played in there like uh, Jerome Richardson. He later uh, went on and became famous as one of the great saxophonists in the, in the, in the jazz business, because when he left here, he was with Lionel Hampton's band. And he stayed back east ever since then after he went back. He never came back here to stay. And and uh, and there were some good musicians developed around here. You know, that great trombonist that, that Duke Ellington had went to Tech High in Oakland. And Ivy Anderson, who was his first woman vocalist, she used to sing in here in San Francisco before she moved to Los Angeles. And uh, that's where Ellington got her, picked her out of the Cotton Club in Los Angeles and put her with his band. And uh, uh, and uh, there was a lot of good music, but there wasn't as many clubs here, to me it seems, as it, some people see, uh, seem to think, because you had just about as much over in Oakland as you had over here, because one, number one, you had a bigger black population. But even Oakland only had one well-known place, and that was Slim Jenkins. Uh, if you want to see a lot of jazz, you had to go down on Central Avenue in Los Angeles. Most of it was down there, they had a bigger population, uh, you had a theater down there, the Lincoln Theater on Central Avenue. That's where the, the center of jazz, act, uh, black activity was on Central Avenue then. Because you had a, a hotel on there, built by a dentist named Dr. Marmillion. He put a, a supper room there on the first floor in that hotel. And that's where I first heard George Dewey Washington and some of the other famous vocalists was in that place. And then every, 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 Friday, every Saturday night they had a show there in the Lincoln Theater called uh, uh, Midnight Ramble. And of course, uh, that's when I was working on the SP. Well, and they, and they said, uh, that my train got in, in Los Angeles every night at 11.30. I'd leave, leave the train and go over there, you know, to the Midnight Ramble. And of course, that's where you heard uh, uh, some of those famous black uh, comedians, like, uh, 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 no, I can't think of their names. Pig now, Meat but Markham. Pig Meat Markham. I heard him there first, and John Mason. Heard him at the Lincoln Theater. Momsen come out to the late 50s, early 60s. Yeah. Early 50s. And, uh, and then you had another club out there called Blaine Nails out in, out in Compton. There was far more activity in Los Angeles because, don't forget, Hollywood was down there. And all the entertainers wanted to get into the movies. That made a big difference. There were also the Percivals and the Both Ann during the time of the Barbary Coast and the great Jelly Roll Morton. Had a club out here till he was rousted. Yeah, you forgot Vernon Alley and Johnny Cooper. Much later, no, much later. later. Uh, Vernon Alley came out here in 38, 39, and Vernon grew up in San Francisco. He, he grew up in San Francisco, and he played football for Commerce High, right. he and he also went here, to though. Sacramento State. He was born uh, in Elko, Nevada. <laughs> Think of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, beyond the time of Jelly Roll and stuff, yes, sir. If, if we could, if you could fast forward for a second, I'd be interested in your take on the current mayoral administration. 
your, your take on Willie's administration, Willie Brown's administration, the current mayoral administration. I met Willie when Willie was going to San Francisco State. His uncle brought him out here. Was, uh, I'd met his uncle. His uncle was a professional gambler. Named Itsy. <laughs> his name was, uh, the only name I knew him was uh, Itsy, Collins. Itsy Collins. And uh, uh, he brought w uh, Willie out here to go, when he finished high school on in, in, in Texas to go to school. Because he went to San Francisco State along with, uh, with John Burton, young of the, of the Burton brothers. They went there together. And, uh, and, uh, and they remained close all through the years because uh, and we got behind Willie at the paper there when he ran, 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 ran for the, the assembly the first time. So we not only gave him publicity and endorsed him, but good to put money in this campaign out of his pocket for Willie. And, uh, uh, and, 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 and uh, that's another alliance that we formed at the papers with Phil Burton. Carlton, Carlton and Phil were very close because Phil used to call the office even after he was elected to the, to the Congress, called Goodland every day. And whenever Goodland and I uh, want to make a long distance call, we'd go down to the, the, the congressman's office in the federal thing and call over that trunk line so we wouldn't have to pay for it. <laughs> call all over the country. <laughs> Sir. Uh, tell us about your experience with Fat Waller. It, it was just in school. Back in, back in New York, right? It was just in school, in grammar school. Yeah. I saw him there. Because yeah. I left there, when, when I left there, I was 11 years old. And I didn't have any, you know, any contacts with him after that. Yeah. Then I started uh, hearing his records out here. And I told my sister, I said, I went to school with that guy. <laughs> yes, sir. Mr. Fleming, I, I read somewhere that you read three or four papers every day, and I'm wondering, do you think newspapers are doing a uh, better job or as good a job as they did 50 years ago? Question is, Tom reads three or four newspapers every day. Does he think newspapers are doing a better job or a worse job than, they're, if, than in that period of time? I think, uh, I think the uh, day, day is not too far. We, we won't have newspapers anymore because uh, when I was a kid in New York City, there was 11 daily papers there. <laughs> They're free there now. When I started work, working uh, with our paper, there were, there were four papers here in San Francisco. You had, you had the News, the Call Bulletin, the Chronicle and Examiner. The News and the Call Bulletin were afternoon papers. The Chronicle and Examiner had the morning business. You also had two papers in Oakland then. Of course, Harris had a paper over in Oakland called the Post and Choir. And plus, the Nolan family owned the Tribune. And, uh, and look at the, how, how, how the number of newspapers are going down. Television is taking, taking a, a, a television is, uh, well, number one, television gets about 90% of the advertising dollar. Bingo. So that's very, very little left for, for radio and the news, and the, news and, and, the, and the printed word. Very little left for them. So, uh, uh, if, if the Chronicle didn't have that, that, that television station, they'd probably be in bad trouble too. And you know, the Hearst chain started here in San Francisco. And he had, he had, he not only had the examiner, he had the call bulletin, an evening paper, and then he had the Post and Choir over in Oakland. They're all gone. They started trying to save them at one time when they merged the, the news and the call bulletin, tried to make a, a single paper. But you had two chains who were competing with, uh, with one another because uh, uh, the, the news was a Scripps Howard paper. There was a chain also. But Scripps Howard is just about dead everywhere is now. But I think, I think the, our day has gone past. We have time for one more question. Yes, ma'am. Let's see if we can get you. Uh, the lady in the back, and maybe we can squeeze you in. Yes, sir. Not exactly a question. But Noah mentioned that you might come back uh, to let us hear the second half of your life experiences. And I was hoping that uh, that could really be uh, arranged because I'm very curious about your newspaper career. That's an excellent point. Maybe because that was so short, we can get this gentleman in who wants to ask yeah. a question. Uh, the thing with the newspaper is that you 
mentioned that in uh, 1944 is when the reporter, when you, uh, you and uh, your other co-founder started the, uh, the reporter, and that uh, Dr. Goodlett didn't get into 1947. And then you mentioned doing this uh, card game, this poker game, uh, with Frank Loren, uh, Carlton uh, got the sun. So am I uh, safe to assume that the Sun Reporter came about, you combined the two? Is that how the name, Sun Reporter, originated? For, for a phonetic reason, we decided to, after we acquired the Sun, to call a paper the Sun Reporter. Because it sounds better, you wouldn't like to say, say reporter son, would you? <laughs> <laughs> but but the, the, the reporter is the oldest paper of the two. I know, because I was here. Well, it's certainly been a rich and rewarding afternoon uh, listening to Tom Fleming. We can go on listening to him for hours, and I really sincerely hope that the library will make time in the future so that we can hear some more from this very erudite warm, scholarly, and knowledgeable man. Thank you very much, Tom. That's what Duke used to say all the time when he love you madly. <laughs> said, uh, you're all very lovely and I love you madly. That's what Duke <laughs> Ellison used to say all the time. Uh, Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Fleming, Mr. Griffin. It was wonderful, and we hope that you'll be available for when we do the second half Guaranteed. of this. Guaranteed. For those of you who would like to see Mr. Well, Fleming, says, I'll be with it. <laughs> Gary, Mr. Fleming, sooner than we'll be able to schedule him into the library, he is appearing, and I don't know the date. Perhaps, Max, you know the date at the Freedom Forum? Yes, I believe it's uh, September 16th, but, it, but uh, I'm going to be at the table with the courts, and if anybody wants to get to your uh, address, I'll send you a postcard about his Right. The Freedom Forum is down on One Market Street, and they are a, 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 they're owned by Gannett, and they do programs all the time um, with news journalists and authors and so forth. It's free. Um, you just have to RSVP, so that is another opportunity to see him next month if you're around and available. So we hope to see you at the Forum and back here at the library for other programs. On September 15th, we will start an exhibition up on the sixth floor skylight gallery called Free at Last, the History of the Abolition of Slavery in America. And with that, on September 30th, Anthony Powell, who is a uh, historian and curator who lives down in San Jose, will do a program on September 30th in the Corret Auditorium. And he will do a program over at the Bayview Branch at 1030 on October 1st for children and families. So, we hope to see you somewhere down the line in the library system. Thank you all for coming. Thanks, Dr. Uh, 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 uh,